Today we're talking to Mike Clark. He's a condor keeper with the LA Zoo. Mike Clark has been working with condors for 31 years. His work includes the day-to-day -day care of condors and um, assisting with their medical care, repelling down cliffs to help with nest entries and condor meet and greets that let the zoo visitors get to know the ambassador birds. The condors in his care are part of the captive breeding program, producing many of the young condors that get released into the wild. Um, hi, Mike, thank you for uh, being with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to get involved in this field? Um, what inspired me, I was always into um, birds as a child, kind of starting off with dinosaurs and then into birds of prey, then growing up um, having birds of prey and pets and all kinds of different stuff, carrots and that type of thing. Um, I always knew that I wanted to work in a zoo setting outside, um, that type of thing. And uh, the inspiration was really birds. Birds were my inspiration. Um, working with them, training them, that type of thing, and keeping them. Um, I think that's the, the answer to the question you want. What was my inspiration? Yeah, I always wanted to work with them because it was something that came naturally to me. Nice. Okay, can you tell us a story about someone in the field that inspired you or that you really admire? Wow, so many. Um, a lot of people that I currently work with still, you know, like Joseph Brandt, all the other past um, people that I worked in the field with, but I'd, I'd have to say that the, the person that most it was inspirational to me was um, uh, Dr. Mike Wallace. Um, he was the curator of birds at the time when he, I got hired, so he pretty much hired me um, in 1989, and there was only 30 birds at the time. Um, and he was saying that, um, yeah, this, this program is about to blow up right now because we have all these new facilities and all these younger birds are, are getting older to where we can start breeding them. And we're going to have a really big uh, population increase in the, over the next 10 years. And we need people that are good with birds to do that. Um, he was, uh, he ended up over the years, he ended up, we ended up being, pretty much best friends and he was a really big mentor to me and he he really is responsible for where the the, uh, the condor program is now I mean he pretty much chose every single release site that we have in the field right now I've proved it at least he was he was the recovery team leader at the time when all of these places were being chosen uh, he did a lot wow. of he did a lot of work with Andean condors in South America he developed the wing tag attachment. Uh, that you see on all the birds. Um, he started the puppet rearing. Um, uh, the, the list goes on and on and on. He's an incredible, incredible person. Um, and unfortunately, about a month ago, he just passed away. So, um, I'm sorry. yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, he thought about Connors right up until the very end. I mean, he's, he, he was the Connor guy. I mean, he, he, was, he, he knew more about him than anybody. He sounds like an amazing man. I've, I've heard a lot about him, but I never met him. Um, what a loss. Yeah, um, tremendous loss. I mean, he wasn't really that all that together towards the end there. He had like nine strokes. So he was, was really taking a toll on him. But, um, you know, he was still like, couldn't communicate very well, but he still loved to hear about what was going on. And, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So what was the most challenging part of becoming a condor keeper um, and how did you overcome that? Well, the, um, I tried to get into the Moore Park College Exotic Animal Training and Management program right out of high school. And it was really tough, tough thing to get into. And, and um, I already had a lot of experience with birds just from, from training and doing and keeping them myself, working in um, pet shops and stuff like that. Um, they rejected my, my, uh, my application. I don't know. Well. They didn't. They, and so I, I, I didn't really have, after having all of that, um, trying so hard and, and, and doing, do my best to get into that program and, um, having them rejected me, I got, I mean, I was, I was young. I mean, I got, I turned off to it. I just didn't want to, I didn't even want to participate with them anymore. And so I just got regular jobs. I uh, eventually, um, was working in an insurance company for like six years and wow. I pretty much burned out on that. Um, 
went through every, every, you know, role in that company that, and, um, and then my, my stepbrother had been an animal keeper at the LA zoo for a long time. And, um, he had moved on and become the director of the orange County zoo. Um, I didn't really know him very well, but I, I knew that, you know, my mom told me to come over and have dinner with us and, and uh, we would talk to him about it. And he said, yeah, there was a keeper class at the LA zoo that they put on every two years or so. And this, the LA zoo is a city facility. So I'm working for the, the city of LA and yeah. civil servant job. So they go through this whole process where they bring in people that would be, um, you know, zookeepers are, are a very specialized type of um, job. And so they really want to be able to sort of, you know, screen out, filter out the people that are really got the right stuff. And so one of the ways they do that is they, they put on this keeper class every two years. Uh, and you basically come in on your, at night, it's like night school and you sit and take notes and all the curators and other parts, uh, other different types of uh, people that work at the zoo give classes. And it really quickly weeds out you know, 90% of the people that come there thinking that a zookeeper is a, or an animal keeper is like this fun job where you get to play with animals. It's <laughs> physical and, um, and you're, it's a lot of responsibility. Um, yeah. And so it, you know, you start out with about 500 people in the class and then pretty quickly it weeds down to about 45 people because wow. they're not expecting that kind of a like lectures and notes and tests and you know having to know everything so um me and a couple of my friends i still know now um passed that class and um then you start volunteering that gives you the opportunity to start to volunteer in the zoo and start and it's really like uh making a name for yourself type of thing and networking and getting people to sort of notice you because of whatever skill you have or hopefully um, you make a good impression with your work ethic and, and attention to detail and being able to follow instructions, that type of thing. And a lot of people just never make it and they just move on. Um, I happened to impress a couple of people there at the time. I, and um, I had stopped volunteering for a long time. And I, had, I had moved and um, my old phone number was still, I had rented a room at my friend's house and my old phone number was still active. And um, my, my, my landlord came in there and saw the answer machine blinking and she played the answer machine. She didn't know how old it was, but one of the zookeepers here had called and said, hey, they're, they're, they're asking for bird people for a bird shell position or a part-time at Condors. And she didn't know how long this, this uh, message had been on the machine. And so she called me and gave me, and I called right away and, um, I just left my job, run a spot and ran down to the zoo for an interview. And um, they-, they So had, many things had to go right for that oh, connection to be made. That's amazing. It's, it really is an amazing story. I'm only telling you little pieces of it, but I left there, it was a Friday and they said they would get, get, get a hold of me on Monday, whether I got it or not, but they had already made their choice and they're like 13 applicants. And, and uh, when I, uh, by the time I got home, there was a message on my, on my answer machine that I'd gotten it. It was just part-time and um, there was a hiring freeze at the zoo like there always is. Yeah. And um, so I had to work, you know, full-time for five years with like part-time hours and that kind of thing before I got full-time. So, so I, I went from like full benefits and, you know, <laughs> dental and eye care and all this stuff and, and, a, and a mortgage to part-time hours and trying to you know so i had to get take a bunch of other jobs too it's at the same time just until i got full full time wow it was and then once once i got here i mean you can't you can't not follow up with, with the condors I, most animal keepers are like yeah yeah like i'm more into you know primates or something like that but um even those people go wow they're like there's something special about them there, there really, really is something special about condors. Um, so how, how do you hope that your work can help support the California condors or support the recovery program? I know you do a lot, um, you know. Yeah, we, 
I guess sort of like sort you know I'm I'm coming close to retiring actually because I'm 31 years I'm 55 so you know what what uh, we do here is we're trying to like you know we, we when we started all of this stuff you know with starting with 30 birds and now you know we're around 500 birds and we've bred much more than that you know we've bred about we've bred almost a thousand birds or something like that close to it. Um, but we still only have 500 birds. And that says a lot, you know, that, that there's a lot more work to be done to, to have that many birds be released and to lose them. We yeah. clearly have a lot of work to do. So what we have been trying to do here in the last, you know, decade or so is try to refine the, 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 lead, the, the, the lead toxicity treatment um, for condors. If they're, they're such an odd bird, they can take so much lead compared to, uh, sorry about that, compared no to a lot of other species. Um, they, uh, and so it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really make sense from, from a clinical standpoint. Um, you know, you say a bird, you know, like a golden eagle or a bald eagle, they're, they're, they're um, stand by. Um, they are, uh, they kind of, uh, die acutely at about 120 micrograms per deciliter of lead in their system. And um, we don't know if it's because, you know, that's, that's clearly the, the reason that they went extinct was lead poisoning. Went extinct yeah. or had to be caught up in the, from, from the wild. Um, and so it could be that, you know, we, we, you, you basically whittled down thousands of birds down to a handful of them that were very, much more tolerant of lead. So, I mean, that's evolution right there. And so they're, they're being put through the pressures of that. And so you, you know, the ones that could, could survive it did survive it or, you know, were saved before they were succumbed to it. Um, the, the birds with the highest tolerance were the ones that were left. It's a theory. But so what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand that more and uh, try to apply things that are going to help save a lot of these birds that come in for lead toxicity. I mean, nowadays, the, 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 uh, the protocols are a little different. We used to treat every bird who was like higher than 35 micrograms or deciliter, but that meant, you know, you could have 20 birds at a time come into the zoo at once. Uh, yeah. None of them showing any clinical signs or anything like that, but they just had, the only signs that they had lead poisoning was in their blood. Um, so now we're, we're mostly only treating birds that are clinical, meaning they're sick. Um, yeah. When they are sick, it's a high chance you're going to lose them. And so what we're trying to do is... Um, really find more meaningful ways of treating them and get, getting them to, 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 come, to come around and, and, and recover uh, with different treatment methods and that type of thing. And, and since the birds are so different and they can take so much, so much more lead, we just don't really understand what is the trigger that causes them to go you know, too far and, and not make it. Um, also- It's crazy to think because people have to get treated with any detectable lead I mean, you know, it, it's it's such a powerful toxin to think that they can not be showing clinical symptoms at, you know, these levels above above thirty five. Yeah, uh, well, the condors themselves are are their whole way of life um, is about showing emotion, showing because what what they're really interested in is 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 communicating with each other. And so they're very, very expressive. Uh, and, and they're so expressive. There's so many different expressions and ways that they can express themselves, body language. Um, we, I mean, we see a lot of it in captivity because we have cameras on them all the time and we're watching every little thing they do. They don't know they're being watched. And so we can see all the subtleties up close and really sort of um, interpret them all because we get to see it over and over and over again uh, and, and see what they end up doing with it. Um, and then there's the uh, there's a much more three dimensional way that they communicate, and that's when they're flying. Um, like I I go into the field and I I watch the birds flying out there, and, and I see you know stark differences in you know between one bird and another bird. And when you go to a nesting, you, you can see one bird out in the, uh, away from the nest, and then you can see a bird at the nest, and they fly totally differently because they have this uh, different like uh, it's a territorial type of dihedral way that they hold their wings and um, just lo lots of different things that are similar to other birds of prey that um, 
that uh, show um, sort of attitudes and stuff like that. And so it's, it's really, um, the way they go about their life is express, outward expression. And, and it's so sophisticated that it's actually, there's a lot of bluffing and faking and basically visually lying about what they, what they have in, in, intending to do. And so yeah. when they're sick with lead, that comes out. So they they hide a lot of, of, of when they're suffering. Um, they yeah. try to look, um, you know, a lot of what Connor's how they behave towards when we when we interact with them or have to interact with them or catch them or watch them. A lot of it is counterintuitive. Um, they they look like they're angry and they're actually very content. You know, they look content when they're actually have anxiety. L lots of things. That, so it's very counterintuitive. And until you can lock into that. Um, they, they can be pretty confusing to people. But once you, once you learn sort of the body language of them, they become this totally different, um, very readable and very relatable animal. And uh, that's Wonderful. probably why they're so interesting to me and the people that I work with is, is how expressive they are. And once you sort of detangle and, um, and decode their body language it is very expressive and it's just it, it's it's multi-dimensional and it's just it's fascinating and you know i get bored easy and i never get bored of condors wonderful um what is your greatest non-work related skill or accomplishment something you'd like to share with us what is my what your greatest non-work related skill or accomplishment oh well i've been a working musician for 30 years and I've been basically um, I've been playing shows um, be, you know before COVID I was playing shows three to six nights a week regularly and touring all over the country as a singer with a band and um, my latest band is the, the Spasmatics that I've been doing since 2001 uh, really successful kind of a cover cover band uh, comedy show type of thing and um uh that's just something that i've always done it's just another thing i've always done i, I make all my money doing doing music but my passion is definitely the, the condors um other things i do i draw um i um my my other passion is falconry um that's um hunting with birds of prey right now i have a, a female golden eagle that i've had for 12 years her name's Betty and we go Amazing. out and we go out and hunt jackrabbits out in the desert with her almost daily for the last 12 years um, so I got a pretty full schedule wow yeah you do um, thank you so much for taking the time out to, to talk with us and, and tell us a little bit about yourself it has been a pleasure talking with you thanks pleasure all mine thank you for having me okay